Hey everybody, Daniel here. This video is a continuation from my interview with Rob Rupol from my intergalactic breakdown. And as you can tell, this video is quite a bit longer. So my intention is to treat this more like a podcast where you can put it on either while you're drawing or just going about your day. And we also talk a lot about finding your voice as an artist, the different ways of practicing, and even the origins of Graphic LA. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy. I watched a talk that you gave um, a while back. I can't remember where it was, but it was you talking about that plain air digital, you know, bringing out your laptop and creating that undercover shade to block out the sun yeah. so you can see what you're doing. It was a really great talk. And um, I guess going back to that specifically, that genesis of graphic LA and, and that way of seeing, were you always uh, interested in that graphic style or did it so slowly come over your career? No, it slowly came over. It, uh, having started off, you know, in industrial design, um, we learned how to like render realistic materials, glasses and steels and metals. And, you know, I've always, always been fascinated with, you know, capturing that illusion of light like John Singer Sargent or a good plein air painting. And that's never about the details. It's always about the sort of broad relationships of values and colors. And so I've, generally worked in a very painterly way until I was like, I was teaching at art center and it was around the third or fourth year or something like that. And the students were using very soft, you know, indiscreet, uh, not indiscreet, um, undescript brushes, very soft, mushy brushes. It's like, no, no, you mean you need to make a decision. You need to make a statement about what is that shape? What is that value? So we started forcing everyone to paint with, big, thick, 100% opaque lines, you know, like 100 pixel, 200 pixel lines and wedges. And everyone's design got so much better because they had to make a decision about something. And so I started thinking, I wonder how far I could take this. You know, could, could everything just be a symbol? And it turns out as long as your values are true and the relationships are true and the, the amount of, I call visual noise, like if you're doing a grassy plane, you just need some kind of noise that recedes in the distance to show perspective. It doesn't have to be grass. It can be almost anything, but as long as it's receding properly to give that depth cue that there's space in this picture, it's not a, you know, you're, you're trying to get the illusion of 3d space, but with very simple 2d um, symbols. I definitely think those constraints too, they, they force creativity upon you because yeah, as you oh, mentioned, absolutely. Yeah, thinking about how to distill really complex shapes, complex values. Um, I tried it the other day, actually. I went to a park uh, and I had like an iPad and was drawing on it. And there was a small lake with, you know, a little waterfall going down. I was just thinking, how am I supposed to capture all of these highlights, all of the different grass pieces and everything like that? And as you mentioned, you know, that visual noise aspect of it, um, kind of nailing that down and, and realizing that it can just really be abstract shapes. But as long as you get the values correct, the overall kind of feel of it in relation to other things. It like almost anything can work, which I find really fascinating about that. And that's what the old matte painters were doing. The guys who were painting on glass and masonite, not the digital ones. They would create um, a picture that looked utterly convincing on screen. But when you actually look at the matte painting itself, it's a mess. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's so impressionistic, you know, this this grassy field is nothing more than organized noise. It just happens to match the color and perspective of the plate that they're using. And um, I think that was the beauty of real matte painting because they were matching the abstractness of reality. And, and reality is pretty abstract. It's our minds that sort of have to name and categorize and organize everything. Um, you know, when we really look at the visual world, it's a, it's a sort of a, messy collection. It's our minds that are flipping through the Rolodex of materials like, oh, that's satin, that's rock, um, that's glowing, so it might be hot. Oh, that's shiny, so it might be slick. And it's only from our experience that we have those sort of touchstones of memory of what that surface could be. But if you, for example, like close one eye and turn your head upside down and look at a landscape, it's just colors and shapes. It really is. It's, it's a, it was a Japanese thing to appreciate the landscape. You look at it from between your legs upside down 
And suddenly you see like these mountains and stuff are actually very faint and hazy. And, you know, they're very, very close in value compared to the trees and stuff that are next to you. But our mind, of course, is constantly trying to figure out what they're made of so we can avoid danger. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It, it almost feels like looking upside down at a landscape is the real life equivalent of flipping your canvas yeah. <laughs> and just getting yeah, that no, new perspective. Right. So, yeah, yeah, and you can you can see how tall mountains and trees literally sink into the atmosphere because this at, the atmosphere is like a thick soup, even on a clear day, that affects everything. The z depth pass of how high something is, or the volume of a mountain as the you know the far corners slip deeper and deeper into the into the atmosphere and how that affects our perception of it our subtle perception of it having form and i guess you know you, you could attest to this too um but cityscapes as well like painting those very very complex there's a lot of perspective involved in architecture and really subtle differences and when you're approaching you know, painting New York or LA or whatever it is do you have a kind of procedure that you follow or is it more about just that interpreting you know the visual noise and and moving that to canvas you try to look for a design first and the design is usually something that is can be broken down into two or three very simple values that makes a very nice pattern on the on the canvas a very interesting shape a very dynamic shape um, I use the example of a checkerboard you can take a canvas and divide it into four equal spaces and alternate dark light dark light and that's not very interesting but the minute you start changing up those proportions and the angles at which you've divided it, then it becomes dynamic. And that's all composition really is, is you want the eye to be interested in the picture and to move around in it and then to finally settle on what you want the viewer to look at. Hmm. So would that be like an example of, of an exercise that you would um, encourage if people were wanting to learn how to kind of abstract the world in this manner and like in graphic reduction? Yeah. And the hardest part is you have to move around um, when you're sketching or painting. You can't just hide under the tree and paint from there. Sometimes you have to like literally move yourself around to be closer or farther away to affect the composition, to make it more dynamic and to make it more interesting. If you just sort of like, you know, sit on the most comfortable space, it's not always the best image and the best composition. And that was one thing I always encourage my students to do. It's like, you know, you've got to be willing to, can't all hide under this tree. You've all got to go out there and like find something more dynamic. Yep. I think for, for me, um, especially when I was learning digital painting to begin with, when I would be, co you know, copying references or doing studies and stuff like that, my interpretation of it was trying to get it as close to the reference as possible. But then at a certain point, you just realize like what makes the image look good? forget the references, but the actual piece right. of art that you're trying to create, like what makes it look good. And sometimes it adheres to different rules than just following everything that that camera, you know, managed to capture in that particular day. Yeah. Copying everything isn't having a point of view. Mm. Having a point of view is selecting and discarding. You know, it's, it's the same with a, a great scene in a movie. It's not just dialogue. People aren't just, somebody just didn't write dialogue. The dialogue is moving the characters forward. The dialogue is moving the situation forward or revealing some information that we need to know. It's never just dialogue. And it's all very carefully done and designed. And, and if you're a guy like Aaron Sorkin, you know, he listens to the music of the dialogue. He writes so that it actually sounds good coming out of their mouths and not just, you know, something uh, arbitrary. Yeah. And, you know, when, when you mentioned that specifically, I think of Tarantino and how effortless everything feels, but it's very, very precise. Like everything, each word has a very specific purpose of moving the story forward or giving exposition in some way or, you know, something like that as well, which is really, weird. I wish we lived in a world where people spoke like Tarantino <laughs> or, or a Guy Ritchie script. It's like, why yeah, can't we yeah. live in that world? Yeah. All these people are so clever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's but it's it's so entertaining where it still feels believable because of the world yeah. that they've created and everyone's right. larger than life, these characters and everything, but you still like, yeah, these people could exist in real life, you know? It's it's very fascinating. Yeah, and that's and that's why we go to the movies because it feels enough like reality that we accept it, but it's so much more interesting and exciting than reality. Mm, that I, that actually perfectly leads into my next question, which is um going back to the lighting keys because I've seen a lot of the beautiful work that you've done and posted on your social media. Uh, with different scenes, 
And because Intergalactic is, you know, based in New York, which is a real place and everything, and a lot of the locations are based off of real locations, when you are creating lighting setups, are you specifically thinking about what's physically possible in that space? Or is it just like we mentioned, creative liberty and making things feel better than they could be achieved in real life? Uh, no, it's a, it's a total cheat in that, the yes, we're using real locations and trying to adhere to the feel of them. But every time we looked down the street when Jabari was riding um, and we kept to real world proportions, that city dissipated really quickly and it was very uninspiring. We were constantly making the background buildings bigger and bigger and bigger because that's how it feels when you're in a city. Given our vantage point of having two eyes and walking around, it feels like we're immersed in this like monstrous um, jungle of cubes. Whereas if you're too literal, it's utterly boring. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's there. But so what? That doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like New York to me. So we were constantly cheating the scale of everything in the background. And um, the lighting, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of cinematography, everything from the 30s to now. But we really focused on films from the 40s and the 50s, not in their we weren't, ne we weren't ever trying to make a period piece in that regard. We weren't trying to make it look like a 40s or 50s film. But given the limitations of the medium, the ASA of the film was so slow back then, 25, maybe 50. They had to use so much light just to get exposure that most of the time the scenes were lit with very, very hard lights. And they learned how to do that, how to um, design that in such a way that it looked somewhat naturalistic, not completely. You know, it's still very stylized, but somewhat naturalistic. And in a way, the films of the a lot of the films of the 50s were very graphic in their nature. Um, one in particular I kept going back to with the lighting artists was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, the original Paul Newman one. And showing them how each main character was lit, not in a believable way, in that they weren't they weren't adhering to the right, the 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 real sort of foot candle um uh, measurements in a room, you know, yes, you know what, that, that beautiful kicker light that's showing the form on this guy. Yeah. We're saying it's from a window or something. It's not really like that. It's the difference between like a beautifully designed image and, you know, um, a reality TV show where they're just sort of, it's called run and gun where you just film stuff and nothing's really designed. So we were actually heavily stylized in our lighting style. We just kept it looking contemporary by keeping, you know, the color palettes and the sort of value arrangements more contemporary. We're never going for a period piece, but it was by looking at those old, beautifully designed black and white and color films from the 40s and 50s that we got that sense of structure and, uh, you know, composition using light and dark to tell the story. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure if you can relate to this too, but sometimes reality just looks wrong, you know, like... yes. It, it doesn't yes. it doesn't feel like it's real, but it's actually a thing. And then if you show that in art, people will be like, that looks strange, even though technically it could be an actual phenomenon. So there's so much truth to that. We're we're constantly trying to, you know, tell show something that can be perceived and convince in a convincing way, right? We're not trying to baffle anybody. So a lot of the times, yeah, you just go, it has to look convincing. It doesn't have to it doesn't have to be true. It just has to look convincing. It has to be readable. I call it readable. Like, is it readable? Can you tell what's going on? You know, can you see the character? Do you understand where he is in the room? That's all you need. You know, and that, obviously you need more than that. But, you know, that's that's a main part of designing an image is like, what am I supposed to look at? What am I supposed to look at? Look at what's important and what am I trying to feel? What do I want the audience to feel? Mm. And usually, uh, you know, for visual mediums, all of this has to happen in a really quick split second. As soon as a, a camera shot changes or something moves, people have to be able to get it really, really quickly and not interpret oh, the yeah. image, but, you know, still be immersed in the story, so to speak. Every, every single shot needs to be quickly readable and quickly understandable. And that's where design comes into play. It does not happen arbitrarily. It does not happen accidentally. Mm. Which is why, you know, you, you do get things like fill lights and kick lights and rim lights and all that just to push the character out from the background a little bit and, you know, depending on the intent of the shot. Um, and one well, thing I, and, oh, sorry, continue. Sorry. We, we see in two eyes, the camera doesn't, the camera has one eye. Yeah. So you, you constantly got to explain to the audience and I, by explain, I mean, visually let them understand the depth in the scene. 
Because, yeah, if you look at a dark room and cover up one eye, it's a mess. You know, you'd have trouble literally navigating that room. But we use two eyes and we, 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 see, depth, we see depth cues all the time because we see in stereo and cameras don't. Yeah, that's for intergalactic as well. Um, a lot of beautiful nighttime shots of New York and you're seeing that kind of purple tones and stuff in the background with the yellow lights coming through and everything like that. And again, it's, it's that interpretation of night. And as an artist too, it's painting night is always such a, do I go for realism, which is I can't see anything or do I go as like the moon is a, is a de facto sun, so to speak. And it's not as strong, but I still have a direction. I still have some kind of influence from ambient lighting to make sure everything's readable. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite DPs, David Mullen, did a really great example. He took a long exposure photograph on a full moon night and first didn't do any color correction on it. And when a long exposure on a full moon night, it looks like daytime. It does. Yeah. It's like <laughs> that harsh shadows. The only difference is it's like, I see some stars in the sky. There's no clouds, but I see stars. And he goes, this is what, you know, the camera sees. Now, Here's what we feel is night. And he pulled some saturation out of it. He fuzzied it up a little bit. He put a little bit more blue in it. And suddenly it felt like what we what we know as night. In um, Color and Light by James Gurney, he has this, you know, that really great exercise about oh, yeah. how to paint. And he brings all those color swatches outside and it's just everything's black and maybe gray. Yes. And, and there, there is yeah. no local color. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, let's let's go back to the the production side of of Intergalactic now, and um, this is more of a technical question, just to follow up with that. But are, are there different versions of character models in terms of the face structure and everything based off of the scenes? Because I know that for for instance, um, a lot of the characters change clothes during the animation, and they all have different outfits, and fashion was a really big part um, of that. So w was that just a swap of character model, or was it just entirely you know something new? No, it's just a, it's a the same, the same character in terms of head and body, because there are actually bodies underneath all those clothes. It's the same character, but it's just a wardrobe swap. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because um, Maurice, uh, our uh, EP and, and writer, um, he had something funny. He's like, you know, if we're going to do Doug, where there's just one character change, then we're doing Doug. But you know, these guys live in New York and it might be good to have them wear more than one thing. And so we really had to think about, yeah, we really had to think about convincing clothing and fashion and stuff that looked, you know, believable in terms of what that person would wear. And that's sort of like sitting on the edge of what's really going on and not looking too dated. And that whole thing too, about character expression um, through clothing, you know, which is what, what fashion's all about and having that Every character has their own identity of clothing. It's not just one outfit that someone's known for, but it's it's how they progress throughout the story. But they're still themselves. If that makes any sense? Yeah, no, it makes total sense, uh, and I and I completely buy it too because I, I was actually used to the the animation trope of like maybe there's two two wardrobe changes and that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But when you but when you watch a, like a good guy Richie film, you know, and you notice that every scene. It's the same character. He just has a different wardrobe, but you're not thrown by it because you know it's a different day. And if, I, I, was, I was glad Maurice was able to push us to doing more of that because I think it did help make a better show. It did help make a better film. Mm. And it does help ground that narrative in a sense of time and place as well as in people moving. And one thing I really um, enjoyed actually was Meadow at, at the end and just sort of like her art exhibition and everyone's in those different clothes and it just get, you know, mm -hmm. you get that feeling of the sense of that she's made it in a, in a way that she's got, you know, got herself out there. Artistically. She's evolved. She's art. She's evolved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, exactly. She's grown. And, and it's a big, it makes it more of a climax. If she showed up and what we've seen her before and with her same hairstyle, I'd be like, Oh, I guess this isn't a big deal. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that, you know, we had a completely different hairstyle and a completely different, much more, um, you know, formal, uh, wardrobe it it makes the event seem more special hmm. and speaking of that character extension with with clothing another thing was um what mr rager meant to jabari and just sort of that manifestation and could you talk a little bit about you know what that character meant and how that aesthetic specifically was designed for for intergalactic he's kind of jabari's alter ego he's he's the one who's commented on big tech and relationships and he's the one who's sort of having 
Mr. Rager having an opinion on the world that Jabari is living in. Now, the easiest way to make the character stand out in such a colorful world is making black and white. And we've got this very painted, colorful world. So let's make Mr. Rager black and white and splattery. So he looks like a bit of graffiti. So he looks like a Banksy or whatever, you know, something that was stenciled on a wall, something that was spray painted on a wall. So um, being able to work with that contrast of literally just getting him to show up in the world was um, a lot of what drove our decisions about designing him. And then there was the, the sort of reduction of him. We we started off with something that was more Samuel Jackson, you know, something more Morpheus. And it just, it seemed too much, you know? And so we kept pulling out and pulling out and simplifying and simplifying until we finally, we just had that sort of silhouette with the the tie and the, uh, and the collar of the shirt, right? I think for me as a viewer watching it, whenever I see Mr. Rager and, and those scenes, especially the, uh, the nightmare sequences, like, everything feels so raw and and maybe because it's so simplified and that reminds me to what len was saying in cosmic comics when he's saying like we don't really do that raw thing over here you know (laughs) but to jabari that's that's his expression that's you know like him and yeah i I don't know i just am fascinated and that's and the the nightmare was one of the fun sequences Uh, every time there was something where we could use the medium of animation we did that's why the flashbacks are told in different styles because it's an animated film. Why not? You know, it's, it's a story. Someone's telling a story. When we think about things in our memories, they, they're not always photo real, you know? And so it was a great uh, excuse to use different styles and just to keep the, to keep the visuals interesting too. Keep them bouncing around. Keep the audience guessing like, what did I just see? Are we seeing, so when, when it does switch to different animation styles as, you know, characters are giving an- anecdotes and stuff like that, is it from their point of view or is it just sort of more of an abstraction thing of, of this is, you know, it helps out. us, it helps us know we're talking about a memory. So yeah. Right. When, um, when, um, um, Meadow's girlfriend is talking about when she met her husband, it's from her point of view, from Karina's point of view. When, um, Oh, what's the when when uh, Kai is talking Kai about and the Russian the Russian hacker? Russian <laughs> it's his story. It's from his point of view. Right, right. Yeah. Were those um, were those done in in two D as well, or were they in those are all two D? All two D. Okay. All those two D sequences. They did such a good job with the New York Ninja and the um, <laughs> the, the the laundry room. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does remind me of that uh, love, death, and robots. Like it, it almost like we stepped into another world for a, you know like a couple of minutes mm-hmm. and then back into uh, into intergalactic. I guess that's why visual noise works so well too. It's because you, you don't actually stop to think about those details, and so you can kind of get away with abstracting them in a in a certain sense. A lot of little squares that are in the proper perspective in the distance feels like a city. Exactly. All you yeah. need to know is that there's a silhouette of a building, maybe, and then just a couple of high value changes, meaning that these could be windows or whatever it is. And your brain just kind of does the rest, which is, you know, that magic actually making it feel so believable. Um, Very much so. Yes. I was enrolled in one of Patrick O'Keefe's course about um, stylized sequence illustration. And he got to the stage of rendering all the cars and the cityscape that he was painting. And it's, it's the same thing of just that impression where it's not, you know, 100% completely accurate, but it's just enough to sell the viewer to still be detailed and believable but it's kind of mm-hmm. looking at that entire picture at the start, which I guess, you know, is why thumbnails are so important when creating compositions like this. Well, it's, again, it goes back to the visual impression. The more detail you put into something, the farther away you get from the, the details start to overwhelm. Right. You know, right. If, if you're going to record a symphony and you're going to mic everybody the same and play it back all at the same you know level, then it's not really going to reflect the music as it's, truly being played. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. Just thinking about being selective in the actual composition about, I mean, I guess that's why we have focal points and stuff too, to kind of direct attention. And uh, one thing that I saw um, on your social media was, uh, I think it was like a stack of albums and going through different um, LODs level of detail just to see, you know, how we can abstract it in, in different shots where if like, if this is the uh, the focal point in this shot, this is how much detail it gets. And if not, and then we kind of like pull it back, which reminds me a lot of, you know, games and how they work too. Yeah. We definitely use that type of thinking because if you paint up a very sort of painterly stack of albums and then you put them all the way across the room, suddenly you've got all this, you know, this high frequency noise that's inappropriate for as far 
as far away as it is. Um, the way film and the way our retinas work is, as stuff diminishes, you know, it really does have less information on it. And you've got, you've got to, that's why painting is so great. So uh, convincing because you don't need a lot of detail in the stuff in the background. We already know, you know, it's the same object. It makes me think of, of that video, you know, about four different Disney artists painting a tree. And mm -hmm. I like to think of it as like having that fundamental skills and everything. It's like being able to string together sentences, but you as an artist, as a creative, what you choose to say with it is a huge statement about, you know, who you are and, and, and your life experiences and everything like that too. Yeah. Each artist brings his own, you know, biases um, with him and, it's like we all have our own signature and we all have our own way of talking. It's not necessarily something we've um, designed. It's kind of inherent to our physical limitations. We all sound differently because we're all made differently. And we all have our own point of view just based on, you know, being a human and based on living. Uh, it's, it's funny. We use a common language. So we all think we think we think alike, but we don't. We, we share we share a common language that helps us communicate. But when I think of like a particular colored blue and it, the emotion that it has, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone thinks of that same color blue. It's all very different. Mm, yeah. We, if I say blue, you could think of light blue. You could think of navy blue, dark blue. Well, yeah. It's just dependent on context, really, and, and your own life mm -hmm. experiences, too. Um, right. Yeah. For, for me personally, I went through sort of a big – um, art style shift in sort of 2020 where um, just for some context I studied games art and, and design at university and so we did a lot of like concept art and modeling and a bunch of different things and at that time I was doing a lot of D&D &D inspired fantasy stuff uh, but in 2020 it just shifted into that graphic reduction and I saw like for instance your work which really inspired me at the beginning and a lot of these other um, creatives and it just sort of like opened my mind to this new way of seeing things that I never really considered before. And something clicked where it just felt easy for me to want to abstract things. And I realized like, oh, I don't have to follow reality all the time. I can change it and add my own flavor into it and what have you, which, which became very liberating in a way to understand I think that. A lot of, I think a lot of people go through that realization, even guys like Picasso. Definitely. You know, he's just like, it's like, I wonder if I could take out more and make a stronger statement. And it turns out you can. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out um, a lot of extra voices doesn't mean a better piece of artwork. And by voices, I mean details. Like if you're painting a tree, what is the essence of a tree? A tree, yes, in real world is like, you know, hundreds of thousands of leaves. That's a tree. But we don't perceive hundreds of thousands of leaves. We perceive a mass that's getting hit by light and the, the rhythm that the trunk grows and the, the rhythms that it holds up those clumps of leaves, those you know packets of leaves. It's not just a thousand individually placed leaves. There's clumping involved and organism and, 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 you know, masses, there's different masses and those masses have different volumes to them and they're not all the same. There's big ones and small ones. And as we learn to, divide up a space like a tree, a shape like a tree into very interesting abstract shapes, it becomes a better design. Yeah, that sort of reminds me, I see, I've seen some of your work on um, Uncharted as well, and just sort of those trees and the shapes and, and the way that you render all the foliage and everything like that. And for someone that's wanting to go down that route and just sort of attempt at that kind of style, would you give any other advice for how to approach color? And, you know, apart from just the simplification of shapes, but yeah, things like color, texture, material, and, and what would you think? Painting from life is, is a great way to train because the, the limitations, right? The sun is going to change in about 90 minutes, a lot. And so you're always trying to capture an impression of something. And so you have to sort of boil away the details and you have to look at what the essence of it is. You know, what makes that and how does that tree sit in the scene? What's it blending in with? What is it similar to in terms of frequency of noise, in terms of value? You know, a lot of the times um, when you close your eyes and look at a scene, it's surprising how much stuff just becomes mushy background detail. And it, it sort of masses together. And uh, Richard Schmidt is really good about getting people to see with his very soft edges and then very hard edges as the contrast of edges. 
um, mimics the impression of detail and closeness of value. The closer things get to each other in value, the less distinct boundaries they have, the less distinct edges they have. And those edges, those boundaries start to mush together a lot. Um, more than people, I think, realize when you look at a beautiful Richard Schmidt painting, you know, there's all these beautiful, soft, lost edges. And then there's these brilliant, hard, super crisp palette knife edges. It's that play of the visual perception between hard contrast of light and shadow and soft, similar, close values where things just start to mush together. It's that play of contrast that makes the image interesting to look at, but also believable. Yeah. That, that kind of visual rhythm of, you know, lost edges, hard edges. And I think that's why um, that graphic style works so well. It's because of that interplay of, of almost feeling like tiles. And personally, I think of a little bit of Lion Decker and how he renders forms and everything. It's very precise. It's very clear about where he's putting different um, lighting on the form, for instance. Well, he's designing the, the form to be beautiful. That's, that's a lot of it, too. It's not just arbitrary. He's not arbitrarily making a hand. He's going like, oh, look at the, the beautiful form of the, you know, the square of the knuckle, the square of the finger rather, but maybe the round mound of the knuckle and how that they, those two shapes play against each other. It's, it's insane. I think you know, that definitely is something to be said for life drawing, just because I think, you know, just looking at a lot of references and stuff and for instance, going in Pinterest and finding something to paint, um, which is still like, uh, I, I think there's value in that as well, but there's sort of it's already been filtered through, through a lens exactly. and somebody's exactly. kind of impression. And I think that kind of, to begin with the very, very beginning and the genesis of that photo versus going out, finding something that you like and sort of your visual filter can lead to, yeah, some really. Yes. To be clear, doing your own work is so much harder. When you paint from someone else's photograph, three quarters of the decisions have already been made for you in terms of color palette, in terms of times of day, in terms of lens choice, by going out by yourself with your own two eyeballs and trying to make a scene. Yes, it's hard. It's, it's much harder than painting from Google, but you will learn a lot more and you will make more personal statements. And even though it sucks more, I think in the end, you'll come out with a better set of skills that will make your voice more unique rather than generic. Yeah. And definitely um, going back to that talk that I, I um, watched you give about just that whole genesis of graphic LA and then painting and creating all these different um, setups and everything like that. What I found so inspiring was that all of that filtered, all of those different paintings like led down into this. And it was you just going out and, and practicing essentially figuring out, you know, what's the best way and doing things for yourself, which I think is a really, you know, really. That's um, exactly it. If I yeah. hadn't been teaching that class, I would have not have gone out and painted every weekend, you know, and so much of it, like Stephen King says, writing means ass and chair. Writing equals ass and chair. <laughs> yep. And so painting equals like you go out. And there, sure, there were mornings where I'd worked all week and I did not want to go teach the class, but I did. And I always came away with something that was like, oh, yeah. And I never set out to do graphic LA. It all evolved from going out all the time and studying and learning and going, what if? What if I did this? You know? And, and listening to that little voice like, what if you did that? Well, let's try it. Let's see. Oh my God, that, that's kind of interesting. What if I took it farther? Making art is very hard. It's not that, you know, there's so much discouragement when you're doing it. Like, oh, why isn't this better? You know, and, and, and yeah, there were times where I'd go out there and paint and I wasn't, didn't feel like I was making any progress, but you kind of like, you know, let a day go by and you go, well, what if I try this? All right, I'm going to go out again. You know, and you just, you just keep, getting up and doing it. And eventually, you know, you, you come across a few ways of thinking and working that work for you. Everyone's brain is different. Everyone's, a, everyone's brain's a different piece of software, you know? And so we have to find out what works best for us. Not everybody, you know, there's so many different ways to approach things as well. There's the, you know, draw everything in line work and fill it in. There's the, you know, make shapes and do whatever. There's, there's, there's no wrong way. I, I once I once watched Mobius draw and he drew the head and he drew the foot and then he drew the rest. He filled it in. It's like, well, that's ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> wow. But he's yeah. Mobius, you know, yeah. Yeah. no one, no one told him that that was the wrong way to work. But he did, that's just, he just did it. Yeah. And he did it really well. He was a really good Mobius, you know? <laughs> so there's no wrong way to approach something necessarily. It's, 
you know, is the picture doing what you need it to do or do people understand it? Does it have the right, you know, are you communicating your idea through the visual medium? How you, how you get there, it, you know, it, it, there's no, there's no necessarily right or wrong way. Everyone, everyone has a different process. Everyone has a different way of working. The Richard Schmidt way is very visual. He looks at a scene and breaks it down in terms of large blocks of value. But you compare him to a painter like Boogaroo, where those guys would do, or um, Ang, those guys would do exhaustive line drawings and really get into the subtlety and the, the overlap of form. And they would really understand the, the concrete boundary of what those forms were. And they did these line drawings that they transferred to canvas and then built up in paint. Very different from Richard Schmidt. Neither is right or wrong. And they're both beautiful pieces of artwork. I think it, yeah, it, it goes down into that kind of um, that question that a lot of uh, students have, myself included at one point, which was like, what brushes do you use? And they're always awesome because right. they, they think it's that the brush itself is going to like, the, the thing about it too, that once I started um, learning about graphic reduction and how to see things visually, it's like tree brush and your brain instantly has an expectation of like, okay, well, when I paint trees, I'm going to use this specific brush. But not necessarily, because there's so many ways of rendering foliage. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can express that, which, you know, I think to your point, yeah, what you were saying is you have to just try things out and see what works for you. The shape of the tree is more important than the brush. Yes. You know, the shape is the design. And I always had trouble with design. And so for me, breaking the design out into its own separate phase, i.e. making very discrete shapes, like when I would sit out to do a scene, you know, it's like, okay, this round circle represents the tree. This triangle represents the mountain. And I would have those on layers and I'd literally move them around. Like, what if I nudge the tree over? Oh, that looks better. So by thinking of it as a very simple, you know, color form shape, it allowed me a little bit more freedom to feel like I could rearrange stuff to make a better picture. And then it was so obvious, like, oh, I should have been doing this all along, but I get, I got too caught up in the you know, the render, oh, I need to render this tree. It's like, no, it's just a shape and I, I can move it where I need it. Exactly. Yeah. And what you were saying earlier with just that our brain attaching meaning and symbolism to things, when if you kind of take a step back a little bit, you realize that that abstraction works for us and not so you know necessarily against us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the best paintings work on a very abstract, simple level. You look at um, like a painting by Frank Frazetta, and they work in big full color reproductions and they work in a tiny half inch black and white, you know, heavy screen. In, in the back of these old magazines, they would sell back issues of the magazine itself. And you would see like, you know, dozens of covers laid out and they were literally half an inch tall in black and white, a heavy screen, right? Not a fine screen. When I say screen, I mean a printing screen, like, it's really about maybe 90 dots in there that are making this image read. But Rosetta's design was so simple and strong that it even worked in that very simple flight, simplified form. And so his stuff worked both ways. It, it, was a, it was a very easy to get conceivable design, not that it's easy to do. And then when the picture was blown up in full color, the details supported that overall design, but never overwhelmed it. He didn't get into fingernails or things like that. You know, you felt like the violence of the scene or the sensualness of the scene. And there was enough form in there that you felt like, oh, that's a, that's a living, breathing person. But the details never started to take you out of the picture. Definitely. That I, I was kind of introduced to that way of, uh, of thinking when I read Framed Ink and then just sort of those little abstraction thumbnails about just a line or a circle or something. And then basing that composition based off of that abstract rhythm. It was like mind blowing for me. I was like, oh, I can actually, when I think about scenes, I think so literally in the sense of, okay, this is a room, this is where the chair is going to be. But if I kind of designed beforehand with like, you know, a curve, a rhythm, a shape, you know, interplay between some things, it, it kind of influences those literal details about, okay, the chair is going to go here, the table is going to go here, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's, it's like having a pleasing abstract, underneath like if you could lift up the paint yeah. you would see that yeah. the abstract design you go oh no wonder it's interesting because it's an abstract it's an interesting abstract rather than the the checkerboard i was talking about earlier there's nothing interesting about that right 
I guess that's why, you know, that, that old, um, golden ratio and why it works. It's because it's that abstraction of that circle, but anything can fit in there in terms of composition. You just have to find those, those proportions, so to speak. And it's a good, it's a good convention that helps you sort of like stay away from, because as human beings, we love to, to make things even and divide spaces evenly as human beings. We love to do that. And you almost have to fight that at every turn, you know, fight our ability, fight, fight our need to organize. (laughs) Yeah, re- reality is random. Re- there's a lot of things that just angles shifted, and I think you Lovely. know one Lovely. one thing too. It's like learning perspective for the you know for the first time or whatever, and it's like everything is that one point perspective. They all go to one vanishing point, but look around and everything's just rotated, and that what you know that's what adds so much believability to a scene. Right, and the the neat thing about my education was we were taught perspective in the very sort of very strict, very uh, mechanical projection plan projection where you had your vanishing points, you had your plan, you projected it through and then you do that. You do that enough and you start to understand the, the logic behind it. And then you can, you can start to discard, you know, the, the exactness of it. And you kind of go, all right, I get what's going on. I think I can fake it, you know, and you do it enough and you, your, your fake is pretty convincing because you've had to practice it. The, um, the legitimate way so much so yeah, hard yeah um something recent that i actually did was just go back and relearn you know the cone of vision and how all of that works and thinking about how to apply um not just a 60 degree cone of vision for instance but any focal length wh- whatever it is and finding the corresponding millimeter and right. then drawing down and then when you understand that like telephoto versus wide angle etc it, it's just sort of you feel it you feel intuitive and you're just like okay well you think more about the creation aspect, not so much the technical. And I think that's, you know, that's point of practicing. <laughs> exactly. It's, I guess it's probably like, you know, practicing classical piano that at first the, the, when you practice the scales, it's probably were boring and redundant and you get tired of it. But once you become so facile with it that you don't have to think about it anymore, then you can actually do something with the music when your, your skill level is, is so practiced that you can actually create something fresh rather than being beholden to the, you know, the original exercise of it. And that's why I think painting from life is great, but at some point you have to, you have to tell a story. You can't just sit there and, you know, you know, copy a model. Definitely. That's, that's where that sort of um, sentence thing comes in, like string the sentence together. Now say something with it, figure out something to say and add meaning to it, which is, yeah, so, so important. Um, something I'm curious about you, Rob, is at this point in your career, what kind of things are you looking for in projects and what sort of excites you now versus like maybe, you know, uh, 10 years ago, for instance? Intergalactic is going to be hard to top because it's just, I use the, um, I use the analogy of a flying a parabola. And when you go up in these planes and you do the, the, par- the parabolic arc and you're, wait- you're weightless, you know? They can only do it for so long, right? You're only wait, wait, waitless for so long, but it's an amazing feeling. And Intergalactic was like that. It's like, oh man, once in a decade, something like this comes along where everything just works. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of time, but that didn't matter. And it was just, it was a wonderful weightless feeling. And then, you know, it comes back to that and it's like, all right, well, I just have to wait for that next weightless feeling. But what I'm looking for, I don't know, at some, at some point, um, you know, it's also who you're working with. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's what do I, do I like my team? Is my team fun? Do we get, do we get along? You know? But not every great piece of work comes from, you know, uh, lots of, lots of times great pieces of art come from conflict. Not that you're looking ever for conflict, but it's that, it's that, that subtle balance of tension, you know, you, you want, uh, what's a, what's another bad analogy I can think of like a race, maybe, you know, like you train and train and train for the race, but you can't control everything on race day. You know, maybe it's rained, maybe you didn't sleep well or whatever. So you always want a great race day, but you can't control every aspect of it. I think that that definitely goes a lot into just confidence about, you know, instead of preparation, but being able to handle things as they come. And and I, I thought of two things actually, when, when you brought that up, it's like, meaning conflict making great art. Um, the first one was Jaws and then the notorious problems they had with Bruce the shark just sort of like oh, falling yeah. over and they had to really think creatively about how to show him and 
because they didn't or they couldn't, it added so much suspense to the entire film. And then they really were selective with the scenes that they that they showed him in. And the same thing goes for Predator as well, the original Predator. Um, oh, yeah. Exact same thing when they filmed in, in the actual jungle and there were like actual scorpions and snakes going about and people were getting sick because they were just in muddy water the entire day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe that's not necessarily uh, necessary to great, create good pieces of art, but what I think happens there is those constraints, very much like graphic reduction, um, leads to that innovation of thinking and, and new ways of, of uh, seeing stuff, so to speak. Well, there's always limits, right? There's always limits. And in Jaws, there were limits of you know, the mechanical shark, but Spielberg knew what he was doing. He was he was young and brash and he had a vision and he understood the medium. That's so important. He understood the medium. He knew how to tell a story with images and sound. And, you know, he was he did such a good job with the characters too. The the differences between Brody and Hooper and Quint um, were so thought out because basically you've got a bunch of middle aged white guys on a boat, right? That could have been really boring and confusing, but each character <laughs> looked each character looked different. Each character had different motivations, behaved different. Brody's completely afraid of the water. You know, Quint is just going to kill this thing, even if it kills everybody on the boat. And, you know, Hooper's kind of in between. He's he's trying, you know, he wants to kill the shark, but he's also fascinated by the shark. So, mm. Yeah, all of that interplay and everything, just incredibly fascinating to, to see. Some of our favorite moments in films and, and games and stuff like that might not have ever happened if it wasn't for some kind of struggle, so to speak, with, with the art. Yeah, or whatever. but if you were to ask Spielberg about Jaws, he had a terrible time on it and he doesn't like to talk about it. Right, and right. A couple of interviews where he said at the very end of it, you know, he was like in his room shaking. You go, it's such a great movie. I can't imagine. It's like, you know what? That was a lot of stress for anybody to be <laughs> yeah, under. Yeah, yeah. Anybody to be under. So yeah, I can see why when it's all done, you're like, I'm just gonna sit here quietly in my room and shake for half an hour. Right. Yeah. That's that's actually something I've been thinking about since um graduating a couple of years ago and just sort of like, you know, seeing where I can find work and everything like that as an artist. And it's sort of like, will working on these huge projects, the ones that get tons of notoriety and everything, is that the thing I'm looking for? Or is it just to be content in the workplace? And I'm happy with everyone else around me. You know, like what 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 exactly is it that I'm trying to find? Which I think is um I think you have to try it all, right? I mean, right. like it's great to work on the big studio projects, but they come with a massive amount of compromise. It's great to work on little stuff, but you don't always have the time and the um, the the budget to pull off exactly what you want. But it's fun to do both. I, I think I think trying to have as many have, trying to have as much varied work experience as possible makes you a more well-rounded person, makes you a more well-rounded artist because, you know, you learn, you learn that, you know, there is compromise in everything. It's picking your battles and what really is worth fighting for. What's an absolute. What's like, no, we cannot do that. And what's like, you know what, in the long term, that might not really matter as much on the screen. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah. that comes, that comes from experience, right? Yeah, of course. And and I think all of those experiences, whether working on big budget stuff or smaller things, it conditions you in a way to not rely on any one procedure, if that makes any sense. Like you're always thinking about different ways yes. of, of yes. creating and yeah, rather than just being, okay, well, we did this for X number of films. They've all been successful. Let's do it again. It, it keeps you pushing as an artist, as a creative. Yeah, you've got to be flexible in your thinking and your approach and your in your problem solving. And yeah, that's what makes it art rather than, you know, mechanical design. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm curious to know about just your experience working in games too and, and the two different industries. Um, my question is like for people trying to get into the industry, especially here in, in Australia, a lot of people are like not fussed either way, whether it's games or films or whatever. Should people try to go for both specifically or is, would you recommend one over the other? I, I'd been at Disney for 11 years and um, I just needed to like freshen up my point of view. And so I wanted to, I, I was seeing a lot of really nice concept work coming out of the gaming industry. and went, maybe I should just go try this for a while. And what gaming taught me was a, a different level of thinking in terms of like, for, for example, when you're working in animation, you can fudge a lot of stuff, you know, stairways, banisters, stuff like that can, you know, it's a stylized cartoony world and you don't have to be too real world. In games, you do have to be a little bit more um, 
true because that character could run up that staircase. So those those stairs actually need to, you know, be proper. They can't be two foot rise over four foot run, right? That's not going to work. They have, they have to be real world. And so it sort of trains your eye a little bit more in a, in a, in a different way to be a little bit more truthful about the details of the picture. And that's something I wasn't doing as much in animation. So uh, I loved everything about Naughty Dog and their way of working. And it really, and it was such a different philosophy, such a different management philosophy too, that it really helped sort of like round me in terms of being a, a better artist and manager. Because if you just know one system, that's not very adaptable. But if you've bounced around and kind of seen like, oh, this particular um, process works better than this. Oh, okay. Let's, you know, let's use that. You, you, you blend all the sort of best of from all the different places in, into, you know, a good working um, process for yourself and those you work with. Mm. Something that I, I just had a thought, like it would be so interesting to see a video game take on that kind of graphic reduction, visual noise aspect of what we're seeing in, in animation now and apply it to something that's interactive. Like I would love to see how that would be interpreted and there's, the limitations. There's a, couple. There's, there's a couple. There's one guy I follow on Twitter who has this um, car game that looks like, you know, the best little graphic. All the effects are very graphic. The lighting is very graphic. All the rendering is very graphic, but it's a, you know, it's a video game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it reminds me of when I spoke to um, Scott Wilhite and he was just saying it's the same thing of, of, the wind effects in Life is Strange, for instance, are just 2D animations. That's an actual graphic wind element that just moves around. And you have all, all you know, sorts of things like that. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of potential there. It goes back to the Miyazaki films when they're outside at night and the wind comes blowing across those fields. Yeah. It's not a real wind effect, but it's certainly, it certainly makes you feel <laughs> that it's real. It's like, oh, it's like I'm really there. <laughs> That, that representation of wind, it's it's funny how you can yeah. feel those elements together. And I guess, yeah, mm-hmm. just with the music, with the lighting, with everything, really, it's like the, the sum of its parts create that impression. Um, yeah, it's, it's always fascinating to think about, again, using that term, the, the macro and micro, just how to think about it. Um, as you were mentioning earlier with, we like to organize a lot of things. And I think as a creative trying to, you know, do something like this. And, and there's so much detail and thinking, having that overall process, if that makes any sense about the, the yeah. grandest, biggest statement about uh, what you're trying to create in the simplest form and then going all the way down into the tiny bits and pieces. And I think mm-hmm. whether you do lines, whether you do painting, whether you do realistic rendering, it all kind of stems from that like thumbnail impression of, of what it is. Well, it's never losing the idea of the image in the first place. Right. Right. And the idea is rarely about adding more details. The idea is usually about boiling away stuff that is getting in the way of what you're trying to say. And that, that I find that to be the most difficult thing because it's, yeah, it's what you choose to say, what you choose not to say as well is just as important, I think. And, and being intentional about leaving things out and kind of, but that, that just goes into having a really clear idea. If you're clear on the idea, and then it's it's easy to kind of make those decisions of like, well, this doesn't fit. Let's get rid of it, you know? But but it's easy to have the details blind you. Something that Steve Houston used to have uh, the students do is like in the last half hour of the drawing, he would say, okay, or the last 15 minutes, don't add anything. Look at it. Put your pencil down. Look at it. Is there anything you can take away? Is there anything you can combine? Is there anything you can simplify to get it back to you know, what your original intention was. And I think that's a great way to look at it because it isn't always about adding, adding, adding. A lot of the times it's like, oh, I've gone to, I, I put too much, I lost my idea because I started sprinkling all this stuff on there that I thought it needed. And guess what? It didn't. It's why that, that thing about painting from life again is just so powerful. It's because of that limitation of you only have an hour or two to, to capture as much as possible. So what are you going to choose to focus on? And then other stuff, other details that maybe, you know, would be nice if you had extra time to go back and work on, but they, they're not necessary to say what you want to say. Because the thing, again, about art and that age old question of when it's finished, people often say it's just abandoned, right? Which is like, you get it to 80% done. And then that 80 to 90, maybe won't make a huge impression on the viewer because most of it's already being said. 
Even Da Vinci struggled with this. If you've actually ever read his notebooks, he said something that I thought was so true. And, you know, it was written for over 400 years ago. He's like, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, the, you know, the life that's in a sketch, the freshness that's in a sketch. How do you maintain that? You know, when you, mm. when you, when you come to doing the final painting, it's like, wow, even those guys struggled with that concept. They were able to see like a sketch is fresh and alive. And, you know, the more I touch it and render it, the deader it gets, but yeah. I don't want it to be better. I want it to maintain that freshness. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly like whenever I'm doing line art stuff, that initial, like, you know, for instance, if I'm doing really clean line art and you have that raw sketch with all the scratchy lines. And as soon as I turn that layer yeah. off, it's like, I don't like this anymore. This looks really weird. <laughs> yeah. And you have to figure out what it was initially that, you know, excited you, which means the viewer is probably excited by it too. And right. you have to yeah. constantly keep circling back to that idea, that impression, that, that impulse, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. That, that initial capture. And I think um, Proko on YouTube actually said this, where it's like, if you're practicing the most important part is actually like the first 10 minutes. Um, and have you, are you familiar with that 80, 20 principle of, oh, know, yeah. yeah, it's, it's that kind of thing of like practicing and cause something I've been really interested in as well, um, is the most efficient way to practice in the sense of, I don't need to render this entire thing fully when I could be doing like three studies that I'm really just focusing on shapes. Um, but if I start moving on to color and stuff, I'm losing that, that kind of that learning method for it to sink in. Um, one of the one of the best things I ever heard in that regard was by one of my teachers, Fred Fixler. He goes, "You like another person's style? Try it on. If it sticks, it's yours." Right. It's like, oh, my God, that's so true. Like, yes, we're all we all look at you know a variety of things, and they're not all going to be authentic to ourselves. But why limit yourself initially by going like, "Well, try it out." That's I mean, like, yeah, you like that? Try it out. If it you know if it doesn't stick, it's not you. It's like. Oh damn, that's that's so liberating in in the thinking. It not only acknowledges that we're a, a mess, you know, in terms of our influences, but it also acknowledges that you know it's okay to like you know ape a little something as long as you don't try to become that person itself. But you know, we all we all learn from other artists. I mean, God knows, I certainly do. You know, like oh, I love the way Neil Ross paints trees. I'm going to try that. You know, I'm never going to be Neil Ross, but I may learn something from me trying to attempt to replicate that. Mm, mm. Yeah, that no, I, I really um, can relate to that as well. And I think it's moving to social media for a second, I think, because a lot of young artists and again, myself included, um, are so obsessed with like finding that style. Like I need a style. I need an identity when very much in reality, it's just sort of everything that you've done leads to that point. I don't think it's necessarily something intentional more so than it's just a byproduct of you trying on, like you mentioned, different artists and seeing how you could paint like them and, and all of that yeah, accumulating and, over time. And style evolves. This whole idea of graphic LA evolved. You know, it didn't, it didn't come into the world completely born. You know, it, it sort of, it started off as a quiet little idea and then it had its little infancy and then it grew up and, you know, but I never set out to do a look in that regard. I was answering a question. So I think the, 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 the trick is to ask good questions and not be afraid to that little quiet voice in the back of your head, even though no one has ever done something, the little voice that goes, but what if we did that? What if we combine this and this? Try it out. You know, you never know where it's going to lead you. Just because someone else hasn't done it doesn't mean it isn't a brilliant idea. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's so important. I think a lot of that comes into introspection and just sort of knowing who you are in a sense and being okay to experiment and try things out. And I think that a lot of things with social media, it's like people kind of get stuck into this this style, so to speak, and they they feel like there's expectation with an audience or for whatever reason. Um, and then they kind of just limit themselves creatively. And I think that is, you kind of have to shut those voices out and just sort of, it has to be like the opposite of that, you know, if that makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. Everyone already has their own style, just like we have our own voice. And the trick is to eliminate enough outside influence that it doesn't crush your own version, your own version of yourself. And it's so easy to get too caught up in, well, how would so-and-so do this? It's like, it doesn't matter. How do I, how am I going to do it? What's my solution? I got to figure out my way of doing it because I'm stuck with who I am. 
same thing of just different voices, different fingerprints. We all have unique elements of us and it's just sort of how we blend it together. And I think one thing about borrowing from other artists too, it's like over time that kind of becomes your shorthand. Like how you like to draw eyes is is your way of drawing eyes, but you've learned it maybe the initial foundation from it is from a few different people. And I like to think of that specifically as uh, cooking. And you have a recipe that you maybe found online, but you've cooked it once, you understand how the whole process works. And then over time, you start to add little things. You start to deviate. You do it your way. You do it your way. It becomes your way. And then it's pretty soon a family recipe. (laughs) And and then there's, I love the idea of woodshedding by, um, who is that great jazz musician? Charlie Bird, Charlie Parker Bird, Charlie Bird Parker. Um, You know, when he went away and developed his style, he did it by, he called it woodshedding. And so he went away for a couple of years. And when he came back, people were like, where'd you find that sound? That sound is like, ah, it's just woodshedding. Meaning he was just sitting there by himself, practicing, practicing, and with no outside influence, just the stuff he had already been exposed to and sort of refining, boiling it into his own little sound. Mm. Yeah. A lot of it comes from within. That's, that's really fascinating. I'll definitely need to look up more of that. I, I've heard of that, uh, I think it was Robert Johnson, if I'm not mistaken, another artist. Like he was a blues guitarist, uh, if, if I got the name correct. And um, he went away for three years. And when he came back, everyone was like, did you sell your soul to the devil? <laughs> and they like, yeah. they thought, yeah, but he's just probably just the exact same method of just going away and doing it again and again and again until it becomes his. Yeah, it's like, okay, I've, I've got enough foundation. Now I need to go do something with it exactly. on my own, yep. Yep. on my own without any more influence coming in. I just need to take what I have. And, you know, start cooking it. And I, I think about artists who are, for instance, very technically skilled. Um, but there's, I think there's a difference between technical skill at a certain point, you know, having having good grasp and fundamentals. And then that thing, what we were saying earlier with that, that voice, that artistic, creative mm-hmm. expression that lets people know that this is you. This is what you're about. And I think that's um, something to be said there. And we're all drawn to different things, right? Um, yeah. If we can get back to the stuff that excited us as a kid before we knew better. Right. You know, before, before we went to school and, and knew better and, and were taught what we, what we should like. You know, if, you can, if, you can, if you can find that stuff that really excited you as a kid and you know, don't even try to figure out why. Just, just do it. You know, yeah, just like, all right, well, that's what I was into. Maybe I can somehow bring that into what I'm doing now. With uh, with style, so to speak, as well, a lot of people think on the the nitty gritty side of it of like line art versus painting, but subject matter itself, what you're choosing to capture, the kinds of things that you want to paint, let you know, forget oh, yeah. style for a second, like that. That's really important too about you know getting that um, artistic identity across. And if I could use line, I would do nothing but draw like Mobius, in that it's so economical and beautiful and quick and but i i've always struggled with line i've never been a line person so once i kind of allowed myself it's like you know what i see things in shape i'm just going to work in shape i just think it i wish i could do line i wish i could be mobius or you know harold steadman um or you know a ralph steadman rather or you know any of these guys that were just brilliant in line or even muka but eh, it's just it's not the software i got the software i got is more shape-based so i gotta go with it Right. And, and nobody can make that decision except yourself, right? Because for instance, yeah. if you were really caught up in that whole comparison trap of like, well, everybody's doing painting in, in my circle and I'm going to do painting too. But deep down, you're like, I'm a line person. <laughs> you know, you won't figure yeah. that out until you're just in, in that wood shutting. So. Exactly. Well, now that we've solved all of life's mysteries, I think, uh, I think we're good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and once again, thank you. I, I really do appreciate um, you speaking to me and, and going into intergalactic and everything like that. Um, really means a lot. So thank no, it's, you. It's always good to, to even to remind myself like why I do this thing and talking about reaching back into the memory and going like, oh yeah, yeah I remember that. That's why I do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, I was I was speaking to Sam like I, I mentioned in, in Instagram. I think Sam Bradley and he was just saying yeah, just just reach out to reach out to Rob and see if if he wanted to chat and and here we are. So yeah, yeah it, we had so many good people on the crew. It's just I would love to get them all together again and do something else. Oh, I'll just have uh, to wait to <laughs> wait till that uh, plane gets back to that weightless parabola. Exactly. Yeah, and as a uh, as an avid fan of all of your work like i <laughs> i want that too <laughs> let's let's make it happen so you know who who knows where it's gonna go but um 
Yeah, no, look, thank, no, not thank, me. I certainly don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, the the next thing is is Spider Verse too, which is like that's gonna that's gonna, that's a whole other thing. We won't get into that right now, but um. <laughs> and that's gonna bring us to the end of the interview. Thanks once again to Rob for our chat, and you can find him on Twitter at Rob H R R or on Instagram at Rob Rupol. And thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you.